This is a reading of Book 3 of Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, read by Momus Najmi. Nicomachean Ethics, Book 3, Chapter 1 Now since virtue is concerned with feelings and actions, and praise and blame come about for willing actions, but for unwilling actions there is forgiveness and sometimes even pity. It is no doubt a necessary thing for those who inquire about virtue to distinguish what is a willing act and what is an unwilling act. And it is a useful thing for lawmakers as well, with a view to honours and punishments. Now it seems that unwilling acts are the ones that happen by force, or through ignorance a force act being one of which the source is external, and an act is of this sort in which the person acting or acted upon contributes nothing. For instance, if a wind carries one off somewhere, or people do, who are in control. But with respect to those things that are done through fear of greater evils, or for the sake of something beautiful, for instance, if a tyrant who was in control of one's parents and children were to order one to do some shameful thing, in the case of one's doing it, they would be saved, but as a result of one's not doing it, they would be killed. There is some dispute whether they are willing or unwilling. Something of this sort happens also in connection with things thrown overboard in a storm. For no one simply throws them away willingly, but all those who have any sense do so for their own safety and that of the rest of the people aboard. Such actions then are mixed, but they are more willing acts, since at the time when they are done they are preferred and the end for which an action takes place is in accordance with its occasion. So one has to say what is willing or unwilling at the time when someone does it, and one does things of this sort willingly. For the source of the moving of the parts that are instrumental in such actions is in oneself, and anything of which the source is in oneself is also up to oneself either to do or not. So things of this sort are willing acts, though in an unqualified sense they would perhaps be unwilling acts, since no one would choose any such thing for itself. Sometimes people are even praised for actions of this sort, when they endure something shameful or painful in return for things that are great and beautiful and conversely they might be blamed, since enduring things that are exceedingly shameful for no beautiful object, or for one only moderately beautiful, belongs to a person of low moral stature. For some things, while no praise is forthcoming, there is forgiveness, when one does what one ought not to do on account of motives of this sort when they strain human nature too far, and no one could endure them. Yet some things perhaps it is not possible to be forced to do, but one ought instead to die suffering the most terrible things. Force the Alcmeon of Euripides to kill his mother seem ridiculous, but it is difficult sometimes to distinguish what sort of thing should be chosen in return for what and what should be endured for what, and still more difficult for those who have discerned it to abide by what they have chosen, since for the most part the things one anticipates are painful, and the things they force one to do are shameful, which is why praise and blame come about according as people are, or are not forced. So what sort of thing? ought one to say is forced. In an unqualified sense, is it not what is done whenever the cause is in external things and the one acting contributes nothing? 
but with those things that are in themselves unwilling acts, but are chosen in the present circumstances and in return for these particular ends, and their source is in the one acting, while they are unwilling acts in themselves in the present circumstances, and in return for these particular ends they are willing acts. But they are more like willing acts, since actions are in the particulars, and with respect to these they are willing acts. But it is not easy to give an account of what sort of things one ought to choose in return for what sort of ends, since there are many differences among the particular circumstances. But if someone claims that things that are pleasant or beautiful are sources of compulsion, for they exert force while being external, everything would be forced according to that person, since everyone does everything for the sake of these ends. Also those who act by force and are unwilling act with pain, while those who act on account of what is pleasant and beautiful do so with pleasure. And it is ridiculous to blame external things but not oneself for being easily caught by such things and to take credit oneself for beautiful deeds but blame the pleasant things for one's shameful deeds. So it appears that what is force is that of which the source is from outside, while the one who is force contributes nothing. What is done on account of ignorance is in every instant not a willing act, but it is unwilling by its painfulness and in once regretting it. For while someone who does a thing on account of ignorance without being in any way distressed by the action has not acted willingly, since he did not even know what he was doing, he has not acted unwillingly either, since he is not pained by it. So since the unwilling person seems to be in repentance for what was done on account of ignorance, let the one who is not repentant, since he is different, be non-willing, since it is better for one who defers to have a special name. But acting on account of ignorance seems different from acting while being ignorant. Since someone who is drunk or angry does not seem to act on account of ignorance, but on account of one of the states mentioned, and while not knowing, but being ignorant. Now every bad person is ignorant of what one ought to do and what one ought to keep away from, and on account of being in error in such a way, people come to be unjust and generally bad. But unwillingness is not meant to be applied because someone is ignorant of what is advantageous. For the ignorance that is involved in choice is a cause not of something unwilling, but of depravity. Nor is it a general kind of ignorance that makes an act unwilling, since people are certainly blamed for that but an ignorance of the particulars in which the action occurs and with which it is concerned, for in these cases there is pity and forgiveness, since the one who is ignorant of any of these acts unwillingly. Perhaps then it would not be a bad idea to distinguish what these circumstances are and how many of them there are. And so they are. Who is acting? what the act is, what is concerned with or consists in, and sometimes also with what, such as an instrument, for the sake of what, such as saving a life, and in what manner, such as gently or violently, it is done. Now no one could be ignorant of all these without being insane, since it is clear that one could not be ignorant of who is acting. For how could one not know at least that this is oneself, but someone might be ignorant of what he is doing, as people say that while they were talking things slipped out, or what they didn't know the things were forbidden to speak of. As Aeschylus said about the mysteries, 
or that they set it off while meaning to show it, as the person said about the catapult. Or someone might suppose that her son was an enemy, as Merope did, or that the spear that came to hand was rounded at the end, or the stone was pumice, or by giving someone something to drink to save his life, one might kill him, or when meaning just to touch, the way sparring partners do, one might land a punch. So since ignorance is possible about all these circumstances in which the action takes place, the person who was ignorant of any of them seems to have acted unwillingly, and especially in the case of the most controlling circumstances and the most controlling ones seem to be the things in which the action consists and for the sake of which it is done. And if an action is to be called unwilling as a result of this sort of ignorance, it is also necessary that it is painful to the one who does it and held in regret. Since an unwilling act is one that is done by force or on account of ignorance, a willing act would seem to be one of which the source is in oneself. When one knows the particular circumstances in which the action takes place, for things done on account of spiritedness or desire are probably not rightly called unwilling acts. In the first place, none of the other animals would any longer do anything willingly, nor would children. And then, of the things that result from desire and spiritedness, do we do none of them willingly? Or do we do the beautiful ones willingly and the shameful ones unwillingly? Or is this ridiculous one one thing is responsible for them? And perhaps it is absurd to call things toward which one ought to extend oneself unwilling, and one ought to get angry at some things and to desire for some things, such as health and knowledge. And while unwilling acts seem to be painful, those that result from desire seem to be pleasant. Also, what difference does it make? Also, what difference does it make to whether things that are wrong are unwilling acts, that they result from reasoning or from spiritedness? Both kinds of error are to be avoided, and irrational feelings seem to be no less human than reasoning is, so that actions that come from spiritedness and desire belong to the human being too. So it is absurd to set these down as unwilling acts. Chapter 2 Now that willing and unwilling acts have been distinguished, it follows next to go through what concerns choice. For this seems to be what belongs most properly to virtue and to determine one's character more than one's actions do. A choice is obviously something willing, but they are not the same thing, as what is willing covers a wider range, since children and the other animals share in willing acts but not in choice, and we speak of things done on the spur of the moment as willing acts but not as things done as a result of choice. Those who say that choice is desire, or spiritedness, or wishing, or some sort of opinion, do not seem to speak rightly, for choice is not shared by irrational beings, while desire and spiritedness are, and a person lacking self-control acts, while desiring something, but not choosing it while a person with self-control conversely acts while choosing something but not desiring it. And while desire sets itself against choice, desire does not set itself against desire, and desire is for what is pleasant or painful, while choice is of something neither painful nor pleasant. Still less is it spiritedness, for things done out of spiritedness seem to be the ones least in accord with choice. But it is surely not wishing either, 
even though there appears a close approximation to it, since there can be no choice of impossible things. And if anyone were to claim to choose something impossible, that person would seem to be foolish. But there is wishing even for impossible things, such as deathlessness. And there is also wishing for things that can in no way be done by oneself, such as for a certain actor to win an award or for an athlete to win a contest. Or for an athlete to win a contest. But no one chooses such things. But only those things one believes could come about by one's own act. Also wishing is rather for an end, while choices of things that are related to the end. For example, we wish to be healthy, but we choose those things by means of which we will become healthy. But we wish to be happy and say so, while it would not fit the meaning to say we choose to be happy. Since universally, choice seems to be concerned with things that are up to us. So it could not be opinion either, since there seem to be opinion about all things, and no less about things that are everlasting or things that are impossible than about things that are up to us. An opinion is divided into the false and the true, not into the bad and the good, while choice instead is divided into the latter. Two kinds. Now, no doubt no one even claims that choice is the same as opinion as a whole, but it is not even the same as some particular opinion. For by choosing good or bad things, we are certain kinds of people, but not by having opinions, and we choose to take or avoid something from among those alternatives. But we have an opinion about what it is or whom it benefits or in what way, while taking or avoiding is not at all what we have as an opinion. And choice is praised for being a choice of what it ought to be, more than for being rightly made, while opinion is praised for being as something truly is. And we choose what we most of all know to be good, but we have opinions about things we do not know very well. And it seems not to be the same people who choose best, who also have the best opinions, but rather some people seem to have better opinions but to choose what they ought not, on account of vice. And if an opinion comes before a choice, or comes along with it, that makes no difference. For we are not considering this, but whether it is the same as any sort of opinion. What then is choice, or what sort of thing is it, since it is none of the things mentioned? It is obviously something willing, but not everything that is willing is something chosen. But might it just be the one that has been deliberated about first. For choice is involved with reason and thinking things through. And even its name seems to give a hint that it is something taken before other things. Chapter 3 But do people deliberate about all things? And is everything a thing to be deliberated about? Or about some things, is deliberation not possible? Perhaps one ought to mean by a thing to be deliberated about, not what some fool or insane person might deliberate about, but those things that people with sense would deliberate about. Now, no one deliberates about everlasting things such as the cosmos, or about the diagonal and side of a square, that they are incommensurable. But neither does one deliberate about things that are in motion, but always happen, according to the same pattern, whether by necessity or else by nature, or by means of some other cause, 
such as solstices and the risings of stars, not about things that are sometimes one way and sometimes another, such as drought and rain, nor about things that are by chance, such as finding a treasure, but not about all human things either. As no Spartan deliberates about how the Scythians should best be governed. For none of these things could happen through us. We deliberate about things that are up to us and are matters of action, and these are the ones that are left. For the causes responsible for things seem to be nature, necessity, and chance, and also intelligence, and everything that is due to a human being. And among human beings, each sort deliberates about the things to be done by its own acts. And there is no deliberation about the precise and self contained kinds of knowledge, such as about letters, for we are not in doubt about how something ought to be spelled, but as many things as come about by our act, but not always in the same way, about these we do deliberate. For example, about the things done by medical skill or skill in business, and more so about piloting a ship than about gymnastic training, to the extent that the former is less precisely formulated, and similarly also about the rest of the skills, but more about these that are arts than those that are kinds of knowledge, since we are more in doubt in connection with the former. Deliberating is present in things that happen in a certain way, for the most part, but are unclear as to how they will turn out, and in which this is undetermined. And we take others as fellow deliberators for large issues, not trusting that we ourselves are adequate to decide them. We deliberate not about ends, but about the things that are related to the ends. For a doctor does not deliberate about whether he will cure someone, nor a rhetorician about whether he will persuade, nor someone holding political office about whether he will produce good order, nor does anyone else deliberate about ends. But having set down the end, they consider in what way and by what means it would be the case. When it appears that the end would come about by more than one means, People examine through which of them it will come about most easily and most beautifully. But if the end will be accomplished by only one means, they examine how it will come to be through this means, and this in turn through some other, until they come to the first thing that will be responsible for the end, which is the last thing in the process of discovery. The one who deliberates in the way described seems to be inquiring and analyzing just as one would with a geometrical diagram, and it is evident that while not all inquiry is deliberation as mathematical inquiries are not, all deliberation is inquiry. And what comes last is an analysis in what comes first in the synthesis. And if people come up against something impossible, they back off. For instance, if the thing requires money, and it is not possible for this to be procured, but if it seems to be possible, they get started with acting. And things are possible which could come about by our own act, for those that are done by the help of friends are in a certain sense by our own act, since the source is in us. Sometimes one is looking for instruments, and at other times for how to use them. And similarly, in other cases, sometimes for that by means of which, and sometimes for how or by whose help. So it seems, as was said, that a human being is a source of actions, and that deliberation is about the things to be done by oneself, while the actions are for the sake of something else. For the end could not be deliberated upon, but the things that are related to the end are, and deliberation is not about the particulars either, such as whether there is a loaf of bread, and whether it has baked long enough, for these things belong to sense perception. And if they would always be deliberated upon, it would go to infinity. What is deliberated, and what is chosen, 
are the same thing except that the thing chosen is already determined since the thing chosen is what is decided out of the deliberation. For each person stops searching for how he will act when he traces the source of it back to himself and to the power of himself that leads the way for this is what chooses. And this is clear also from the ancient regimes that Homer depicted, for the kings used to report what they had chosen to their people. Since among the things that are up to us, the desired thing that has been deliberated upon is what is chosen, choice would be the deliberate desire of things that are up to us. For having decided as a result of deliberating, we desire in accordance with our deliberation. So let this have been a description of choice in outline, and of what sort of things it concerns, and that they are means to ends. Chapter 4 But it was said that wishing is for the end, and it seems to some that it is for the good, to others that is for the apparent good. But for those who say, that what is wished for is the good. It turns out that what someone wishes for who does not select it rightly is not wished for at all. For if it is to be something wished for, it is also good. But if it were to happen as assumed, it would be bad. While for those in turn who say that what is wished for is the apparent good, it follows that there would not be anything that is by nature wished for, but only what seems good to each person. But different things appear good to different people, and even if it is so happens, contrary things. But then if these results are not satisfactory, must one not say that what is wished for simply and truly is the good, but for each person the apparent good? Then to the person of serious moral stature, what is wished for would be what is truly good, but to a flightly sort of person it would be any random thing, just as in the case of bodies. For the ones that are in good condition, those things are healthy that truly are so, while for the ones that are sickly, different things might be healthy. And similarly, in the case of what is bitter or sweet or hot or heavy, or of any other sort, for the person of serious moral stature discerns each thing correctly, and in each kind of thing the true instance shows itself to such a person. For in accordance with each sort of active condition there are special things that are beautiful and pleasant. And the person of serious moral stature is distinguished most of all, perhaps for seeing what is truly so in each kind, since such a person is like a rule and measure of what is beautiful and pleasant. In most people, a distortion seems to come about by the action of pleasure, since it appears good when it is not. So people choose the pleasant as good and avoid the painful as bad. Chapter 5 Since then what is wished for is the end while the things related to the end are deliberated about and chosen. The actions involving these things would be results of choice and willing acts. And the ways of being at work that belong to the virtues are concerned with these acts. Therefore virtue is up to us, and likewise also wise. For in those cases in which acting is up to us, not acting is also up to us. And where it is up to us to say no, it is also up to us to say yes. And if it is up to us not to act when this would be a beautiful thing, it is also up to us to act when it is an ugly thing. But if doing the things that are beautiful or ugly is up to us, and likewise refraining from doing them, then this is what it is to be good or bad people. Therefore being decent or base is up to us. To say that no one is willingly wretched, 
or unwillingly happy seems to be partly false and partly true. For no one is happy unwillingly, but baseness is something willing. Either that or one ought to dispute the things that were just now said and assert that a human being is not a source and be getter of actions just as much as of children. But if these things seem correct and we are not able to trace our actions back to any other sources besides those that are in us, then those things of which the sources are in us are also up to us and willing acts. What is done by each person privately and by the lawmakers themselves seems to bear witness to these conclusions, for they punish and take vengeance on people who do vicious things. All those who do not do them by being forced or as a result of ignorance for which they are not themselves responsible, and honor those who do beautiful things, so as to encourage the ones and deter the others. And yet no one encourages us to do things that are neither up to us nor willing acts, since it would be no use to be persuaded not to feel heat or pain or hunger or anything else of that sort, since we shall feel them nonetheless. In fact, people apply punishment for ignorance itself if the one who is ignorant seems to be responsible for it, as when the penalties are doubled for people who are drunk, for the source is in oneself, since one has the power not to get drunk, which is the cause of the ignorance. And they also punish those who are ignorant of anything in the laws which one ought to know and which is not difficult to know, and similarly in other cases in which people seem to be ignorant through carelessness, on the grounds that it is up to people themselves not to be ignorant, since they are in control of how much care they take. But perhaps one is not the sort of person who takes any care, since people are themselves responsible for having become that sort by living carelessly, and for being unjust or dissipated, in the one case by acting dishonestly or in the other by passing their time in drinking and things of that sort. For it is the ways of being at work involved in each way of acting that produce such people. And this is clear from the kinds of training they are for any sort of competition or performance, for people perfect themselves by being at work. So in order to be unaware that it is from one's being at work, involved in each way of acting, that one's active condition come about, one would have to be completely unconscious. Also, it is unreasonable for the person who is unjust to wish not to be unjust, or for the person who is dissipated to wish not to be dissipated. If someone who is not ignorant does things as a result of which one will be an unjust person, that person would be unjust willingly and will not stop being unjust and be just simply because he wishes to any more than a person who is sick will be healthy by wishing to. It may so happen that one got sick willingly by living without self-restraint and disobeying one's doctors. In that case, it was in one's power at one time not to get sick, but that is no longer possible for one who has given up one's health, just as it is not possible for someone who has thrown a rock to take it back again. Nevertheless, to have thrown and launch it was up to oneself, since the source was in oneself. In that way too, it was in the power of an unjust or dissipated person at the beginning not to have come to be that way, which is why they are that way willingly. But once they have become so, it is no longer possible not to be so. And it is only the vices of the soul that come about willingly, but also and it is not only the vices of the soul that come about willingly, but also in some people corruptions of the body, and we censure them for these also. For while no one blames those who are ill-formed by nature, people do censure those who are that way through lack of exercise and neglect. And it is similar also with sickliness and disability. For no one would reproach a person who was blind by nature or from disease or from an injury 
but instead would feel pity. But everyone would censure a person who goes blind from drunkenness or other dissipation. So of the corruptions involving the body, the ones that are up to us are censured, but the ones that are not up to us are not. And if it is this way with them, then also in the case of other sorts of corruption, the ones that are censured must be to us. But suppose someone were to say that all people aim at the apparent good, but they are not in control of how things appear, but rather whatever sort of person each one is, of that sort do does the end appear to anyone. So if each one were in some way responsible for one's own active condition, then each would be in some way responsible oneself for how things appear. But if not, no one is responsible for wrongdoing by oneself, but does these things through ignorance of the end. Believing that by these means one will secure the highest good for oneself. But the targeting of the end is not self-chosen. Instead, one needs to be born having something like vision, by which to discern rightly and choose what is truly good. And one in whom this is naturally right is of a fortunate nature. For with respect to what is greatest and most beautiful, and which is impossible to get or to learn from anyone else, but which one will have in each a condition as one was born with. To be well and beautifully born in this respect would be the complete and true blessing of nature. But if these things are true, in what way would virtue be any more willing than wise? For to both the good person and the bad, the end appears and is laid down in the same way, by nature or in whatever manner, and they act in whatever way they act, by referring everything else to this end. So whether the end does not appear by nature to each person, as whatever sort of thing it is, but in some respect is dependent on oneself, or whether the end is natural but virtue is something willing because a serious person does everything else willingly. Wise would be no less willing. For what is done by one's own means is present in the actions of the bad person, even if not in the end. If then, as was said, the virtues are willing things, since we ourselves are in a certain way jointly responsible for our active conditions, and by being people of a certain sort, we set down the end as being of that sort. Then the wisest must be willing things too, since they come about in a similar way. About the virtues in common then, the general class to which they belong has been stated by us, that they are mean conditions and that they are active conditions and that on account of themselves they make one apt to do those things by which they come about, and that they are up to us, and willing things, and that they make one do things in the way that right person would dictate. But our actions and our active conditions are not willing in the same way, since we are in control of our actions from beginning to end. So long as we know the particulars, while of our active conditions we are in control of their beginnings, but the process by which they add to themselves is not known in particular, any more than in the advance of a disease. But because it was up to us to make use of them in a certain way or not, for that reason they are willing things. But taking up again, what concerns each of the virtues? Let us say what they are and what sort of things they are involved with, and how. How many of them there are will also be clear at the same time. Chapter 6 Let us speak of courage, that it is mean condition concerned with fear and confidence, has already become evident. And it is clear that we fear things that are frightening, and that these are, to put it simply, bad things. And hence fear is defined as an expectation of something bad. And we do fear all bad things, such as loss of reputation, poverty, disease, loss of friends, 
and death. But a courageous person seems not to be concerned with all these things. Some things one ought to fear, and it is even a beautiful thing to fear them, and a shameful thing not to, such as loss of reputation. For the ones who fear it is decent and has a sense of shame, while the one who does not fear it is shameless. But he may be called courageous by some people in a sense altered from its proper meaning, since he has some likeness to a courageous person, for a courageous person is someone fearless. Also one ought not, perhaps, to fear poverty or disease, or generally any of those things that do not result from vice and are not caused by oneself. Even so, the one who is without fear of these things is not courageous either, though we say even this on account of a likeness, since some people who are cowards when there is danger of war are generous and bear up confidently to the loss of money. And neither is someone a coward if he fears insolence toward his children and wife, or envy or anything of the sort, nor is someone courageous who is defined when he is about to be punished by a whipping. In connection with that sort of frightening things, then, is someone courageous, or is it in connection with the greatest of them? For no one is more apt to endure terrifying things. But the most frightening thing is death, for it is a limit, and it seems that there is nothing beyond it to be good or bad for the one who is dead. But it would seem that the courageous person is not concerned with death in every situation, such as at sea or by disease. In what situations then? Or is it in the ones that are the most beautiful? But these are the ones that occur in war, for they occur in the midst of the greatest and most beautiful sort of danger. And the honors given in cities and by kings are in agreement with these conclusions. In the governing sense, then, one would call courageous a person who is unafraid in the face of a beautiful death, and in whatever circumstances make death be close at hand. And such most of all are the things involved in war. It is not that a courageous person is not also unafraid at sea and in diseases, but it is not in the same way that sailors are. For those who are courageous have given up hope of safety and are disdainful of such a death, while the sailors are full of good hope on account of their experience. The courageous show courage at once in situations in which there is a defense, or in which dying is a beautiful thing, but in those other types of destruction neither possibility is present. Chapter 7 while the same things are not frightening to all people, we speak of some things as beyond a human being. These then are frightening to everyone, or at least to anyone with any sense. But frightening things are on a human scale, differ in magnitude and as greater or lesser, and similarly with things that inspire confidence. But the courageous person is as undaunted as a human being can be. And while such a person will be frightened even of such things as vary in magnitude, he will endure them in the way one ought, and keeping them in proportion, for the sake of the beautiful, since this is the end that belongs to virtue. But it is possible to fear these things more or less, and also to fear things that are not frightening as though they were. One way of going wrong comes from fearing something one ought not to fear. Another from fearing something in a way one ought not to fear it. Another from fearing something when one ought not, or anything of that sort, and it is similar with things that inspire confidence. So one who endures or fears what one ought, for the reason one ought, as one ought, when one ought, and is confident in similar ways, is courageous, 
Since a courageous person undergoes things and acts in accordance with what is worthy and in a way that is proportionate. Now the end of any way of being at work is what corresponds to the active condition it comes from. And to a courageous person, courage is a beautiful thing. And so its end is something beautiful as well, since each thing is determined by its end. So it is for the sake of the beautiful that the courageous person endures and does the things that are in accord with courage. Among those are excessive. The sort who exceed in the fearlessness are without a name. And it was mentioned by us in what preceded that many of these things are without names. Though one would have to be insane or incapable of feeling pain if one were to fear nothing not even an earthquake or a flood, as people say about Celts, and the sort who exceed in confidence about frightening things are rash. The rash person seems to be a braggart who makes a pretense of courage. At any rate, he wants to appear to be the way the courageous person is in relation to frightening things, and he mimics courage in those situations in which he can. Since most of these people are brash cowards, for though they make a show of boldness where they can, they do not stand up to frightening things. The person who is excessive in fearing is a coward, and all such qualifications as fearing things one ought not to fear in a way one ought not to fear them apply to such a person. He is also deficient in feeling confident, but is more apparent of being excessive in his pains. A coward is someone with faint hope, since such a person is afraid of everything. And a courageous person is the opposite, since confidence belongs to someone full of hope. So the coward, the rash person and the courageous person are concerned with the same things, but they bear themselves differently toward them, since the former kinds exceed and fall short, while the latter is in a mean condition and is as one ought to be. Also rash people are impulsive and are eager prior to the dangerous occasions, but hold back in the midst of them. While courageous people are sharply intent in the midst of deeds were calm beforehand. So as was said, courage is a mean condition concerning things that are confidence inspiring or frightening in the circumstances stated. It chooses something and endures it because it is a beautiful thing or because not to do so would be a shameful thing. But to die as a way of running away from poverty or love or anything painful does not belong to a courageous person, but rather to a coward. For to run away from distressing things is softness. And such a person does not endure death because it is a beautiful thing, but as a way of escaping something bad. Chapter 8 Courage, then, is a thing of this sort. But there are also other things that are called courage in five ways. First, there is an active condition that comes from citizenship, since it is most like courage. For citizens seem to endure dangers on account of the penalties that come from the laws and reproaches and on account of honours, and because of this those people seem to be most courageous among whom cowards are dishonoured and courageous people are honoured. Homer fashions people of this sort, such as Diomedes and Hector. Polydamus will be the first to lay censure upon me. And for Hector, one day will say in public address, to the Trojans, Tydeus's son, under fear of me. And this most closely resembles the courage described above, because it comes about by means of a virtue, since it is on account of a sense of shame and a craving for something beautiful, since it is for honour, and to escape reproach, which is something shameful. 
One might also assign to the same group those who are forced by their rulers, but they are inferior to the extent that they act not from a sense of shame but from fear, and by avoiding not what is shameful but what is painful, since those who are in charge force them, as Hector does. And if I see anyone covering up away from the battle, I will be a sure thing that he won't escape the dogs. And those who assign positions and beat the men who draw back do the same thing. As to those who position men alongside trenches or things of that sort, for they all force them. But one ought not to be brave by compulsion, but because it is a beautiful thing. And experience in connection with each kind of situation also seems to be courage, which is why Socrates believed that courage is knowledge. But different people are experienced in different things, and in what pertains to war it is the professional soldiers, since there seem to be many empty threats belonging to war, and these people most of all have seen them all. So these appear courageous, because the others do not know what sort of situations are present. Then too they are most able, as a result of their experience, to do unto others and not be done to, being competent to use armor and having on whatever sort would be most effective for giving and for not taking damage. So they are like armed men fighting unarmed ones, or athletes fighting untrained people. For in athletic contests too, it is not the most courageous people who are the most effective fighters, but those who are strongest and whose bodies are in the best shape. But professional soldiers become cowards whenever the danger strains them too far and they are left behind in numbers and equipment, for they are the first to run away. While the citizen forces die holding their ground, the very thing that happened at the temple of Hermes, for to the latter it is a shameful thing to run away, and death is to be chosen over that sort of safety. While the former, from the beginning, were braving the danger on the grounds that they were more powerful, and once they have determined otherwise, they run away, fearing death more than disgrace, but the courageous person is not that way. Also, people extend spiritedness to mean courage, for those who on account of spiritedness are like wild animals carried away onto people who have wounded them, seem to be courageous, because courageous people do are of a spirited kind. For spiritedness is most impulsive towards dangers, which is why Homer says he hurled strength into their spirits and he roused their strength and spiritedness, and a sharp passion flared his nostrils, and his blood seethed. For all such words seem to refer to the rousing and stirring of spiritedness. So while the courageous people act on account of the beautiful, spiritedness works along with it in them, but wild animals react to pain since their spiritedness comes from being hit or from being frightened. For if they are in the woods, they do not rush forward. So hurrying on toward danger on account of being driven out by pain and spiritedness, while foreseeing none of its terrors, is not courage, since at that rate even donkeys would be courageous when they are hungry, for being beaten will not hold them back from their food. Even adulterers do many daring things on account of lust. But the sort of bravery that comes from spiritedness seems to be the most natural, and when it includes in addition choice, and something for the sake of which it acts, it seems to be courage. But people also feel pain when they are angered and feel pressure when they take revenge. But those who fight for these reasons, while they are effective fighters, are not courageous, since they do not act on account of the beautiful or as reason determines, but from passion, but they have something very close to courage. Nor are those who are full of hope courageous, since it is on account of having been victorious often over many people that they are confident in dangerous situations, but they are much like courageous people, 
since both are confident. But while courageous people are confident on account of what was said above, these people are so from believing they will be the strongest and will suffer nothing. Those who get drunk do something of this sort, since they become full of hope. But whenever things do not turn out for them in such a way as they expect, they run away. But it belongs to the courageous person to endure things that are and appear frightening to a human being, because it is a beautiful thing and not to do so would be a shameful thing. Hence also, it seems to be characteristic of a more courageous person to be fearless and undisturbed in sudden frights than in those that are evident in advance. For it would come from an active condition of the soul since it would be less of a result of preparation. For one might choose things that are evident in advance from calculation and reason, but things that are sudden are chosen in accordance with one's active state. Those who are ignorant also appear to be courageous and are not far from those who are full of hope. But they are worse to the extent that they have nothing they consider worth facing, while the others do. This is why the hopeful hold their ground for a certain time. But those who are deceived run away if they recognize that something is different or suspect it, which is what the Argives had happened to them when they fell among the Spartans they took for Sionians. So what sort of people are courageous has been said, as well as what sort of people seem to be courageous. Chapter 9 And courage, though it is concerned with confidence and fear, is not considered with both to a similar degree, but is concerned more with frightening things. Since it is one who is undisturbed in these situations, and bears oneself towards them as one ought who is courageous, rather than one who is that way in occasions of confidence. So it is for enduring painful things, as was said, that people are called courageous, and courage too is painful, and it is justly praised, since it is more difficult to endure painful things than to refrain from pleasant ones. Nevertheless, it would seem that the end that goes with courage is pleasant, but is blocked from sight by the things that encircle it. Such a thing also happens in gymnastic contests, for to boxers, the end for the sake of which they fight is something pleasant, the crown of leaves and the honours that come with it. But being hit is painful, since boxes are made of flesh and burdensome, as is all the hard labour, because these pains are many, that for the sake of which they are endured, since it is a small thing, appears to be nothing pleasant at all. So if what is involved in courage is also of this sort, death and injuries will be painful to the courageous person, who will undergo them unwillingly, but will endure them because it is a beautiful thing, and not to do so would be a shameful thing. And to the extent that one more nearly has all virtue and is happier, the more will one be pained at the possibility of death, for to such a person living is most worthwhile, and this person will be deprived of the greatest goods knowingly, and this is painful. Still, such a person is courageous nonetheless, and perhaps even more so, because he prefers what is beautiful in war above those other things. So being at work pleasantly is not present within all the virtues, except to the extent that one fixes one's attention upon the end. This does not, perhaps, imply that such people would be the most effective professional soldiers, but those who are less courageous and have nothing else good in their lives would be, since these people are ready to face dangers and they put up their lives in exchange for small gains. 
so let courage have been discussed to this extent. It is not difficult to comprehend what it is, in outline at least, from what has been said. Chapter 10 And after this, let us speak about temperance, since these seem to be the virtues of the irrational part of the soul. Now it was said by us that temperance is a mean condition concerning pleasures, for it is less concerned with pains, and not in a similar way, while dissipation manifests itself in the same situations. Let us now distinguish, then, what sorts of pleasures it is concerned with, and these are divided into those that pertain to the soul and those that are bodily. Examples are the passion for honor and the passion for learning. For someone who is passionately devoted to either of these takes delight in it, even though the body experiences nothing, but rather one's thinking does. And those who are concerned with pleasures of this sort are not spoken of as either temperate or dissipated. And likewise, neither are those who are concerned with any other pleasures that are not bodily. For people who love talking and tend to go on at length and pass whole days talking about anything that occurs to them are loquacious, but we don't speak of them as dissipated nor say this of people who are grieving over possessions of friends. So temperance would be concerned with bodily pleasures, but not even with all of these for people who delight in things that come by way of sight, such as colors, shapes, paintings, are not spoken of as either temperate or dissipated, even though it would seem to be possible to delight in these things too, either as one ought or to excess or deficiently, and it is similar with the things connected with hearing. For no one speaks of people who delight excessively in music and acting as dissipated, or of those who do so as one ought as temperate. Nor do we speak that way of those concerned with smell, except incidentally, for we do not call people who delight in the smells of fruit or roses or incense dissipated but rather those who delight in perfumes or sauces, since it is dissipated people who take delight in these, because by means of them relocation comes to them of the things they yearn for. One might view others too, when they are hungry, as taking delight in the smells of food, but delighting in such things belong to the dissipated persons, since it is to such a person that these are objects of yearning. Nor is there any pleasure from these senses in the other animals, except incidentally. For dogs delight not in the smells of rabbits, but in eating meat. The smell brought about the perception, nor does the lion delight in the sound of the cow, but in its meat. But it perceived that the cow was nearby through the sound, and seems to delight in that, and likewise not in seeing a deer or a wild goat, but because it will have meat. Temperance and dissipation are concerned with pleasures of this sort which the rest of the animals share in, which is why these pleasures have a slavish and animal-like look, and they are touch and taste. But these pleasures seem to make use of taste only a little, or not at all, for what belongs to taste is distinguishing flavors, which people do when they test wines or prepare sauces, and they don't especially take delight in these acts, or at least dissipated people don't but rather in the enjoyment which comes about entirely through touch, in both foods and drinks as well as in the act said to be devoted to Aphrodite. And this is why a certain person, who was a gourmet, prayed for his gullet to become longer than that of a crane, since the pleasure was in the contact. So it is most widely shared of the senses that dissipation applies to, and it would seem justly to be the most reproached wise because it is present not in so far as we are human beings, but in so far as we are animals. And to delight in such things and love them most of all is animal-like. The pleasures from touch that most belong to free people, 
are set aside as distinct, such as those that come about in the gymnasium from massage or heat, since the sort of touch that is characteristic of a dissipated person doesn't involve the whole body, but only certain parts of it. Chapter 11 Some desires seem to be shared in common, while others seem to be confined to certain people and cultivated. For example, the desire for food is natural, since every being that needs it desires dry or moist nourishment, and sometimes both, and one that is young and reaching its peak desires sex, as Homer says. But not everyone has a desire for this, or that particular sort of food, or for the same sorts, and hence what is desired seems to be our own preferences. Nevertheless, it also has something natural in it, since different things are pleasant to different sorts of people, and some things are more pleasant to everyone than any random things would be. So in the natural desires, few people go wrong, and in one direction, toward too much, since eating or drinking whatever it may be until one is over full is to exceed what is natural in amount, for the natural desire is to fulfill one's need. Hence these people are called greedy guts since they fill the belly beyond need, and those who come to be that way are people who are too slavish. But many people go wrong in many ways, in connection with the pleasures that are confined to certain people, for those who are said to be passionately devoted to such pleasures are so called either for delighting in things they ought not to delight in, or more than most people do, or in a way that they ought not, and dissipated people go to excess in all these ways, for they do delight in some things they ought not, when they are despicable things, and if one ought to delight in some things, they delight in either more than one ought or more than most people do. It is clear then that excess in connection with pleasures is dissipation and is to be blamed. But concerning pains, it is not the same way as with courage. One is not called temperate for enduring pains or dissipated for not enduring them, but rather the dissipated person is so called for being more pained than one ought to be because one does not happen upon pleasant things, and so pleasure even causes pain to such a person. And the temperate person is so called for not being pained at the absence or abstention from what is pleasant. So the dissipated person desires all things that are pleasant, or those that are most pleasant and is led so much by desire as to choose these things in preference to all others. And this is why a dissipated person is pained both by missing out on pleasures and by desiring them, since desire involves pain, though it seems absurd to be pained on account of pleasure. People who fall short in things concerned with pleasures and delight in them less than one ought don't turn up very often for such insensitivity is not human. Even the rest of the animals discriminate among foods and delight in some but not in others. And if there is any for which no food is pleasant or no food differs in pleasure from any other, that animal would be a long way from what it is to be human, since they do not turn up very often and such a person has not gotten a name. The temperate person is in a mean condition concerning these things and is not pleased by the things that a dissipated person takes most pleasure in, but instead has disdain for them and in general is not pleased by things one ought not to take pleasure in and is not greatly pleased by anything of the sort and feels neither pain nor desire when they are absent or only moderately so and not more than one ought or when one ought not or anything at all of that sort. But those things that are pleasant and lead to health and to being in good condition, the temperate person will desire moderately, and in the way one ought, as he will desire the other pleasant things that are not impediments to health and good condition, and are not contrary to what is beautiful, and not beyond his resources. One who would go that far 
loves such pleasures more than they deserve. But the temperate person is not that sort, but is one who loves them in the way right reason judges. Chapter 12 Dissipation seems like something more willing than cowardice, since one is for pleasure while the other is on account of pain, of which the former is chosen while the latter is avoided. Also, pain deranges one and ruins the nature of the person who has it, while pleasure does nothing of the sort and so is more willing. For this reason too, Dissipation is more reproached, for it is easier to habituate oneself in connection with pleasures, since there are many such things in the course of life, and the process of habituation is without dangers, but the opposite is the case with frightening things. But cowardice, unlike its particular instances, might seem to be something willing, since the condition itself is painless, while the occasions of it make one so deranged by pain that one even throws down one's arm and disgraces oneself in other ways, and hence they seem to be things one is forced to do. But with a dissipated person, conversely, the particular instances are willing acts, for they are done by someone desiring and yearning to do them. But the whole condition is less so, since no one desires to be dissipated. We also apply the word for dissipation to the misbehavior of children, since it has some likeness, which is named after which makes no difference to the things now being explored. But it is clear that the later condition is named after the earlier one, and the meaning seems to have been transferred not badly, for anything that has a lot of growth while stretching out toward ugly things needs to be kept back, and of this sort, most of all are desire and a child. For children do live in accordance with desire, and the desire for what is pleasant is greatest in them. If then the desire will not be obedient and come under a ruler, it will have come to great strength. For in someone without understanding, the desire for pleasure is insatiable and comes from all sides, and the being at work of desire makes its innate strength grow. If desires are great and vehement, they even knock the reasoning power out of commission. Hence it is necessary for desires to be moderate and few, and not opposed to reason. Such a condition as we call obedient and disciplined and just as a child needs to live by the instruction of a tutor, so too is the desiring part of the soul related to reason. This is why the desiring part of a temperate person needs to be in harmony with reason, for the aim to which both look is the beautiful, and the temperate person desires when one ought, as one ought, when one ought which is what reason also prescribes. Let these things then have been said about temperance. End of Book 3